All right, good. There we go. Uh, so I will uh, be posting a lecture quiz sometime uh, either this evening or maybe tomorrow. I'll post that. It'll be due next week. That'll be your last lecture quiz. We won't be having any more lab quizzes. I've mentioned that before. We had our last lab quiz a couple weeks ago. Um, so we just got one more lecture quiz. And then um, let's see, next week on Monday, we got, uh, we'll got we be reviewing for your exams. On Wednesday, you won't have lecture. Uh, we won't meet in person for lecture, but we will have lab where you'll have your lab exam. And I'll be posting your, your lecture exam to Moodle on Monday. And you'll have a week to take that. Um, again, we'll have a review day on Monday to go over information like that. Uh, let's see your wildlife society meeting today. It's our last meeting of the year. We're going to um, talk about the parade, uh, both the parades, the Waynesville parade and the Canton parade that we're going to participate in. So be there if you can. Uh, it'd be good to be at that meeting. What else? I think that about covers announcements for today. So we'll pick back up where we left off. Uh, we finished up uh, several of the other orders of fish here. Now we're going to move into the Persiforms, Persiformes, which are the perch-like fish. This is the largest order of vertebrate animals in the world. It's the largest order of vertebrates. 41% of all bony fish fall into this order. And there's 160 different families in this order. So it's a very large group of organisms. Uh, and there's several of these little tiny colorful fish that live in our streams that we call darters. They're not really um, good. They're, they're not bait fish. They're not, uh, and they're not game fish. So you don't uh, catch them. They're not commercially important, but they are incredibly ecologically important. Um, so they fill a lot of roles in our streams. There's just a whole bunch of them. I always think of darters as kind of like the songbirds of fish. There's just there's just a ton of little freshwater darters that uh, we're going to learn a couple in this class. You're going to learn a lot in ichthyology. You'll probably learn some in aquatic ecology as well. Um, but we'll start with the gilt darter, Persina evides. Uh, it's got a robust body for a darter. Most of the darters are very small and they've got long, thin bodies. The gilt darter's kind of got a, a pretty uh, robust body, so it's kind of thick. Uh, it's got two dorsal fins that are almost connected, so they're not quite connected, but they almost touch each other there. Uh, it's got a large eye that's kind of more positioned towards the top of its head. You can really see that in this side picture here. Uh, its nose is slightly rounded or kind of blunt. That's helpful to determine some of these darters. They've got dark blotches evenly spaced along the side of their bodies in a line. And the first dorsal fin is reddish orange in color. Oh, look at that. See that reddish orange color there? That's also helpful for ID. And we compare that to the tangerine darter, which kind of has a similar color pattern, uh, but it's much more brightly colored. Uh, you've got a lot of orange on it, hence the name tangerine darter. Uh, this one's also a pretty large body darter. That's fairly big for a darter. You can see the person holding it up there, tell how big it is. Um, <clears throat> they also have two dorsal fins that are almost connected. They have large eyes that are kind of at the top of their head which probably means that they're usually towards the bottom of the water column because they're looking up. Uh, they have a dark olive upper body with dark splotches on it and then bright orange underneath. The males will be very bright orange. That's their breeding coloration. The females are a little bit less bright. <clears throat> There's also an orange band on the top of the first dorsal fin. You notice here. Then we have the banded darter. So now we're getting into the much smaller darters. Um, the banded darter has bars or bands or blotches, whatever you want to call them, um, on the side of the body. Its first dorsal fin is clear or white. There's going to be blue on the tail fin, the anal fin, and the pelvic fin. 
and there'll be one or two spot at the pelvic fin base. I'm sorry, on the tail fin base. So you can see one spot, one spot. Harder to see on this one, but there's a spot there, and there's one there. The drawing doesn't do a good job of showing the spots. But here on this one, you can see a little spot there. It's, I don't really see the little spot down here, but it's down there somewhere. <clears throat> those are so that's really one of the best ID characteristics of those two little spots. You compare that to the green fin darter. We're gonna have green fin darter and green sides darter. The green fin darter, of course, has green fins, like the name suggests. They're gray above with orange to pink on the belly. Uh, they have dark horizontal lines between their scale rows. This is really a really good ID characteristic that gives them this kind of broken line appearance. You can barely make it out on this bottom picture, but you see it kind of in the top picture, these little tiny dots, splotches. That's a good uh, ID characteristic for green fin darter. Uh, there's also... Um, the males and females have a dark marginal and cream colored submarginal band on their median fins. What does that mean? That means the fins towards the middle of the body. Um, and when we're talking, um, well, they're kind of towards the back of the body, actually. So you see this line that outlines the dorsal fin, the anal fin, as well as the caudal fin. And if you look at the one that's actually got green fins, meaning this one's in breeding plumage, you'll see it's like a green line and then a dark line, or a white line and then a dark line. Green, white, and then dark. Green, white, and then a little bit of a dark line there. So that's a good ID characteristic for green fin darter is that white outline of the fins. Particularly comparing it to green sides darter, which does not have a white outline on the fins. Uh, it's a little more colorful. They have red and green in their dorsal fin. They've got dark U-shaped splotches on the side of their body, particularly on the lower half. You see these U-shaped splotches here. And they're dark. You can even see it on the live specimen. Some of them, you have to use your imagination to see a U, but they're there and then uh, it's got a short blunt nose that's another thing you could notice for identification is its nose is is blunt and short compare it back to the to the green fin darter which is more of a pointy nose that sticks out a little bit blunt and short uh, then a fish that you're probably familiar with if at least if you fish at all uh, is the yellow perch percaflovescens they're very common fish in our waterways, um, particularly our lakes. Uh, they've got two dorsal fins that are almost connected, just like most of this group. They've got a large eye. They've got small teeth on their jaws, so that's a little bit helpful for identification. Uh, but more importantly, they've got these dark vertical bands. When I was growing up, we used to just call these coon tails because they look like a raccoon's tail with the stripes on them. Uh, let's see here. They've got uh, their body is going to be greenish or golden color, kind of a mix with yellow iridescence, meaning that depending on how you hold it, it's going to flash yellow. Uh, again, it's got these dark bars on the side, uh, and then it's got a greenish. Um, I don't know why it's written on there twice. Greenish gold body with yellow iridescence. It also has orange fins. That's another good helpful ID characteristic are these orange, the pectoral, the anal, and the uh, pelvic fins are all fairly orange. So that's another helpful ID characteristic. There's not much you're going to confuse yellow perch with, though. I don't think they, they look pretty unique. Then we have walleye, sander vitreous. So that's a game fish up here, in, uh, or well, all over. Um, we, uh, there's also muscalunge and then uh, uh, sauger and sauge, um, which we're not going to uh, cover in this class, but you'll get an ichthyology. So those are all your um, your sander. They're all in the genus sander, uh, but they're big game fish. They're they're fun to catch. They they fight really hard. Um, it's just a really neat fish. 
let's see they've got two dorsal fins that are pretty pretty well separated you can obviously make out the separation there a good id characteristic is this dark blotch at the back of the first dorsal fin you can see it on most of these pictures there's a little darker blotch there the other thing to look for is a white uh, tipped lobe the bottom lobe of the fin will have a little white tip on it as will the anal fin will have a white tip you can kind of make it out in the picture here but with the white background they kind of wash out <clears throat> uh, let's see here they've got a large eye that's where the name walleye comes from because they got this big eye uh, they have canine teeth so you can see these sharp teeth in their mouth. And yes, that does hurt if they bite you. Uh, their pelvic fin is larger than their pectoral fin. That can be sometimes a helpful ID characteristic. So here's their pelvic fin and their pectoral fin. The pelvic is larger. No, I'm sorry, this is the pelvic fin. This is the pectoral. This is the anal fin back here. So the pelvic fin is larger than the pectoral fin. Uh, other than that, coloration, they're just kind of this pale yellow or greenish color, and they might have some brown blotches on them. Uh, but those are going to be more or less noticeable depending on the individual. You can go by the teeth, go by the black splotch on the, on the dorsal fin. Those are really helpful ID characteristics. Then we got the sunfish. Uh, so these are also a uh, very important game fish. We talked a little bit about bluegill and red breast sunfish uh, when we talked about farm pond management. Um, uh, so we'll just, this ID wise, here's a bluegill. They've got a small mouth. They're, they're oval shaped. They've got round bodies. Uh, they're somewhat lavender and bronze in color with about six dark bars on the sides. Okay. Oh. Make those out here in this picture for sure. And you can kind of make them out in the drawing. An, a great ID characteristic for bluegill is that they have a black spot at the rear edge of their gill cover. So this right here. And it's not, we call this the opercular tab. And it's not very long. And it does not have a red spot on the end. There's other sunfish that will have a black opercular tab, but they're going to have a red or a white spot on the end of it. Uh, another thing to look for is the black spot at the posterior portion of the dorsal fin. So this little, it's kind of hard to make out, but it's like a faint black blotch right here. That's a really good characteristic for bluegill. If you see that, you're looking at a bluegill. If you see a black splotch here and one here, then you're looking at a, a green sunfish more than likely. So one black blotch, that's a bluegill. Two of them, that's a green sunfish, which we don't have on our list. So don't worry about the green right now. Let's see here. The flap at the end of the gill cover is black with no red spot. I already mentioned that. That's called the opercular tab. Bluegills prefer quiet, weedy waters where they can hide and feed. They inhabit lakes and ponds, slow moving rivers and streams with sand, mud, or gravel bottoms. They like to be near aquatic vegetation. Uh, they spawn, they're well known for bedding in large groups. They make these circular beds uh, and they'll be, they'll be just like this, uh, one or two adults per bed guarding the bed. Uh, and usually those beds are touching one another. So you've got a whole big complex of a whole bunch of bluegill together when they're spawning. The red breast sunfish, Lepomis auritis. You notice it's got a black opercular tab, but notice how long that opercular tab is compared to the bluegill. It's got a very long opercular tab. The males will have this yellow or orange or reddish breast. Uh, they will be olive on the upper sides, which blends into kind of a blue, uh, a blue tinged bronze on the lower side. They'll have these blue streaks on the cheek. That's another good ID characteristic to look for on red-breasted sunfish. Uh, let's see, are there uh, soft dorsal fin? 
will be uh, tipped in red, which is usually pretty difficult to see. So this is the soft dorsal, is this black portion here that's that's uh, flexible. The spiny dorsal is here with the harder bones in it. Uh, and I don't really make out that. You can kind of see the red on the drawing here, but it's not it's not a very obvious, it's not a good ID characteristic. Um, let's see, they got very long, no wider than the eye gill flap, and it's got a elongated black spot on it. Uh, the gill flaps may reach a length of one inch or more. So that's it, that's significant. That's a big, long ear flap there, or gill flap. Unlike most uh, sunfishes, red breasts will actually bite at night. So if you're fishing at night, red breast is a good fish you'll probably be catching. Rock bass, which is not really a bass. Um, it's it's one of the sunfish. So it's not tech, which bass are technically sunfish, but this is not, uh, it's more closely related to these red breast sunfish or, or, um, um, uh, bluegill or green sunfish, something like that, then it is closely related to a bass. Uh, it gets its name from being associated with rocky habitat. That's why we call it a rock bass. It's a robust fish, not as flattened from the sides as most of the other sunfish. So it's, it's pretty fat. It's a good uh, eating fish. They're usually six to eight inches long. They're golden brown to olive with a silvery white belly. They have mottled and shading lighter, lighter, mottled and shading lighter on the sides. I don't know what I was going for there, but uh, mottled means that there's just this mix of light and dark brown coloration, kind of all mixed together, jumbled together, not really any discernible pattern. They're just mottled. Uh, the side scales all have a dark spot at the base, so it gives it this kind of polka dotted appearance. You can see that on the live specimens and the picture here let's see here uh, they've usually got a red eye you'll often just hear this species called a red eye or red eye bass um, and that red that eye can actually be red or orange it depends on the individual and their gill cover or their operculum has this black smudge on it which is not easy to make out in this picture here, but it's right there. And you can see it in the lower picture there. And then the drawing shows it really well. So black smudge there. That's really helpful for identification of a rock bass. Then we have our two uh, most common game fishes, or some of our most popular game fishes, the smallmouth bass and the largemouth bass. They're um, both in the genus Micropterus. Smallmouth bass is Micropterus dolomule. Largemouth is Micropterus salmoides. Uh, and it's, they're pretty easy to tell apart once you once you figure it out. Uh, so when their mouth is closed, obviously a smallmouth bass has a smaller mouth than a largemouth bass, hence the name. So when you look at their mouth, when it is closed, on a smallmouth bass, that mouth ends right about where the eye is. On a largemouth bass, when the mouth is closed, it extends far past the eye. So that's one way to know you're looking at a largemouth versus a smallmouth. Uh, color variation can also help. Um, on a smallmouth, color varies from yellow to green or olive to green with a blonde bronze reflection. The sides usually have these vertical bars on them, so the bars go up and down. Whereas on a large mouth, you've got more horizontal bars, so the bar runs from front to back instead of up and down. <clears throat> Small mouths usually have these three horizontal bars that run across their opercular tab. So, or like on their cheek, basically. These three lines here, you look at large mouth. They don't really have those, or at least they're not as prominent. Uh, let's see here. Smallmouths spawn in April or early May. The average smallmouth bass is between one and two pounds and ranges from 12 to 15 inches in length. And you can catch smallies up here uh, pretty commonly. 
You can also catch largemouth up here. Uh, and if you know where to look, they're in some of our uh, lakes around here. Uh, same deal. They're olive green on the sides, greenish gray. The stripes and blotches are the, the really the way to tell the difference as well as the size of the mouth. Um, we'll see larger individuals are usually females. And adults, uh, largemouth bass will eat just about anything they can fit in their mouth. So crayfish, frogs, large insects, other fish, ducklings, um, all kinds of stuff. Anything they can catch. And that's all the, the perches were, the Persiformes fish we're going to cover. Like I said, it's the largest order of fish, so that was a very small sample. We'll cover a lot more when we get to ichthyology, uh, but that was a good introduction to sunfish or perches. Um, Salmoniformes are the salmon, the trout, and the char. It only contains one family. That means we call this a monophyletic order. Whenever you have a... Um, a taxa, which is just a you know kingdom phylum order class. You have one of those that only has one species in it. We call it monophyletic. So Salmonidae only has one family in it, so we call it monophyletic. Or Salmoniformes has one family in it. It's monophyletic. Salmonidae. Uh, tremendous value for recreational fishing and commercial production. You probably know that. People love to fish for salmon, trout, and char. Uh, a good ID characteristic is that salmon, trout, and char all have what's called an adipose fin. So it's this little extra fin on the uh, uh, on the back. It's not a dorsal fin. It's past behind the dorsal fin. It's farther back on the body. When you see that adipose fin, you should think this is either a trout or a salmon or a char or it's a catfish. Those are the two groups that typically have adipose fins. We'll start with brook trout. That's the one that's native here. So it's native to the eastern United States, particularly mountainous regions. They have a worm-like pattern across their dorsal side of the body. Uh, so you can kind of make that out here, but these are more wormy lines. And then it turns into spots as it heads down the body. <clears throat> uh, they have no hard rays uh, and they have a lot of wavy lines in their dorsal fin. They can develop bright spots outlined in blue during the breeding season. So when you see them looking real pretty with these spots that are outlined in blue, that means it's breeding season. Uh, they're not actually a trout. They are technically a char, which is just a small, one of the small members of this family, the Salmonidae family. Uh, they have pec their pectoral, their pelvic, and anal fins have bright white leading edges. And that's the really good ID characteristic is looking for these white leading edges. You can be standing on the bank of a river and you'll see the white shining uh, when the light catches it. So that's a really good ID characteristic. You know, you're looking at a brook trout and not a brown trout or a rainbow. <clears throat> the belly might be bright orange. Um the heck it also may be more of a, a tan brown color just depends on uh, time of year uh, another key for brook trout is you're looking at light <clears throat> excuse me light spots on a dark background so when you're looking at these salmon and trout you should try to figure out is it light spots on a dark background or dark spots on a light background if it's light on a dark background then you're looking at brook trout if it's dark on the light then you're either rainbow or brown which here's brown here's rainbow we'll talk about the differences so brown trout uh salmo trotta have large dark spots on a well it's kind of a dark background so dark spots on a dark background i guess is the way they describe this one it has no spots in its caudal fin so its tail fin lacks spots which is different from rainbow trout which does have spots in its caudal fin Brown trout are usually pretty yellow on their bellies. Uh, they can develop bright orange spots during the breeding season. You can see in the picture here, they get pretty colorful. Uh, br uh, brown trout are not native to North America. They're native to Germany. But they've been adapted well here, and they've been introduced to many of our streams as a, as a game fish. 
They have a high tolerance of water temp and water quality, so they can tolerate changes in temperature and water quality. It's one of the reasons they get introduced to so many places. They're, they, they do well at surviving in these places. Same is true for rainbow trout. They have a pretty good tolerance for water temperature and quality, so we introduce rainbow trout to a lot of places. They are not native to the eastern United States. They're native to the west coast. Um, so they're not native species here. We do uh, heavily release them into our um, into our, our rivers and lakes around here. Uh, but again, they are not native, so keep that in mind. They are an exotic species, even though they're native to the West Coast. They're not native here. Uh, heavily raised in fish hatcheries, particularly around here. They got small black dots on a light background. There's no spots on the gill cover, so that can be helpful. Some, you know, everything's variable in nature. So sometimes these brown trout and rainbows and brook trout get to looking like each other. So you look for some of these other clues, like there's no spots on the gill cover for a rainbow trout. Also, they've got a pink, usually have a pink stripe down the side of the body. That's very obvious. Makes for an easy ID when you can see that pink stripe. Uh, they migrate from salt water to fresh water in their natural habitat. So on the West Coast, they usually migrate from salt to fresh water to, to spawn. That makes them anadromous. We'll talk about that term in ichthyology. They have a medium tolerance for water temperature and water quality, so they can tolerate some pollution, some, some warming. And then our last group is going to be the catfishes, Siluriformes. Uh, again, I just mentioned catfishes also have have adipose fins, just like salmon. So what do catfish and salmon have in common? They have adipose fins. Uh, catfish also have barbels. These, what, we, what you might commonly call whiskers. These things hanging off the front. They aren't whiskers, they're barbels. And they're actually covered with taste buds. So they use these for uh, taste. They They swim around dragging those barbels on the bottom of the water or on the bottom of the uh, water body, tasting everything. When they, when they touch something tasty, they eat it. The largest in the family is the blue catfish. They can get very large. The world record is 143 pounds. That's a picture of it right there, 143 pound catfish. That's pretty crazy. Uh, they're often misidentified as channel catfish. Uh, when folks catch them, you know, just the layman catch them, they, you know, they just confuse blue cats and channel cats together, which are the two species we're going to cover here. Uh, the best way, the most absolute way to tell the difference between catfish and channel catfish, or blue cat and channel catfish, is to count the anal fin rays. So that would be the, the little bony rays that stick out in the anal fin here. Blue cats have 30 to 36 while channel cats have 25 to 29 anal fin rays. So that can that can be helpful. Other things, though, if you're just looking at it, uh, the blue catfish typically has a straight edge on its anal fin. You can see this long straight edge here. This one's a little more rounded. But in the picture of the real fish, you can see how long and straight it is. And then on a channel catfish, it's very curved. See the curve here. Uh, blue cats never have dark spots on them, so you'll never see these dark blotches. Channel catfish often have black spots, but they don't always. You can see these two here. You know, if I just glanced at that and didn't take my time, I might call it a blue cat, but it's not. That's a channel cat. Look at the anal fin but it doesn't have any spots. So keep that in mind. Spots are not really a good ID characteristic for these two. The blue cat has this dorsal hump, which you can really make out in the drawing here. How it kind of, the head just dips down after the, after the dorsal fin. You can see it a little bit in the, in the picture, but not quite as pronounced. They have a deeply forked caudal fin, which is true for both of the species of catfish we're covering here but helpful for distinguishing them from other catfish. Uh, they're considered, blue cats are considered an invasive pest in some, in, in some areas of the United States, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay. They can tolerate brackish water. 
So that's where they, you know, get into the Chesapeake and they cause problems. They're one of the only species of, of fish in the Mississippi River Basin that are able to eat, excuse me, able to eat adult Asian carp. Uh, Asian carp are highly invasive. They're causing big issues in our streams. So it's good to have a fish that can eat adult carp. And then the channel catfish, uh, we already mentioned some of this stuff. So the anal fin is rounded versus a straight edge. Uh, both, you know, has the deeply forked caudal fin, just like the blue cat. Uh, but this one often will have these dark spots. Again, that's not a hundred percent, but if you see the dark spots, you'll know though that's a, that's not a blue cat. It's probably a channel channel cat. If you don't see the blue the dark spots, then you need to go a little further. You might want to count the anal fin rays, or at least look at the shape of the anal fin to say, oh yeah, that's pretty rounded. That's a channel cat. Uh, channel cats have really good sense of taste and smell. Uh, their olfactory receptors are sensitive enough to detect several amino acids at about one part per hundred million in the water. So they could just a little tiny speck of, of uh, amino acids, which would detect that there's some sort of creature around uh, or something rotting or whatever in the water. That's all they need is just one one part per hundred millions in the water to taste that. They have taste buds distributed all over the surface of their entire body. So channel cats taste everywhere. They're omnivorous. They eat just about everything. And they're cavity nesters. So they look for uh, you know places like under root balls or logs or whatever in the water to hide in. Or maybe even just a, like a cave in the mud. And that is all the fish. So that is our last uh, PowerPoint of new information that we'll cover for this class. We will talk about uh, acorns this afternoon in lab. We're going to do float tests and all that. Uh, if you're online, I've, I'll post a little uh, project for you to do on your own if you're interested in, in taking part in the float test. Um, but everybody else here will do that in person. Uh, if you haven't got your shirt yet, by the way, your Columbia shirt. I have those in my office, so come to the lab today and you'll get one. Uh, let me know if you got any questions about anything, and I'll see y'all at one.